up apps with electron.net. And if you're not totally familiar with Electron, uh, Electron is a web development framework that uses technology such as Chromium rendering engine and the Node.js runtime. And one of the main advantages of Electron is that it allows you to target uh, native applications for Windows, OS X, and Linux. And even if you're not a developer, chances are you've used something that's built with Electron. Uh, for our .NET community, I think Visual Studio Code would be at the top of that list, but also other products like Slack, Discord, Skype, dozens of others that are not listed here. And that's all well and good if you're a web developer and you like JavaScript or TypeScript, but what about us in the .NET community? What if we want to develop using C Sharp and using our familiar .NET APIs? How do we do a cross-platform? Well, that's where Electron.net comes in. So Electron.net uh, wraps a standard Electron application that has an embedded ASP.NET Core application within it. So if you know how to do something with ASP.NET Core, uh, you can have that running on uh, Mac and Linux also. So it's open source. Uh, the link to the GitHub project is at the last bullet point, point here on the slide. And you can uh, use the, uh, this open source project to invoke Electron APIs, but using our familiar C Sharp syntax. Uh, Electron.net also includes a uh, command line extension. This is how we build and launch our applications for various platforms. As far as software prerequisites, all you really need is uh, Node.js and .NET Core 3.1 or better. And I've been using .NET 5 all week and have not had uh, any problems at all. And one of the reasons that I became kind of an advocate for this open source tool is that I've actually used it in my own uh, development work. Uh, about a year ago, uh, Grape City, the company I work for, uh, had a, um, an internal uh, data analysis library that was used in some of our other products, and we spun it off into a product of its own. And it was kind of you know, obtuse to deal with programmatically. And I wanted to add a shiny front end to it so people could have a, a nice interface for importing data, maybe even running queries and doing data visualizations. So I started off with straight Electron. Uh, I had a uh, command line, .NET command line tool to interface to my uh, library assembly. And I would call, use shell commands to call into that. And after a while, it yeah, it sort of worked, but it was kind of cumbersome to do business that way. And that's when I discovered Electron.net. So I could do away with the shell commands. I could talk to my library directly in C Sharp. And I also had access to uh, MVC components that uh, Grape City develops, so I could have some like really nice data visualizations in my uh, tool. And another reason to do uh, Electron.net applications is that I had a requirement that I had to be able to import data from local sources, you know, whether it's a CSV file and a network share or perhaps an on-premises instance of SQL Server. So what we're going to run through, uh, hopefully I get all this in, uh, start with a plain vanilla ASP.NET Core application, uh, show you how to add Electron.net components to it, uh, we'll create some custom content and we'll show how uh, launching and debugging works. Then we'll dive into the various APIs so we could have native message boxes, file save dialogues, and custom application menus. And lastly, we'll uh, integrate a third party control, a chart into our application, and briefly touch on cross platform deployment. So I'll begin with just a plain blank terminal. Create a new directory, CD into it, and I'll create my app by doing .NET new web app. So this will give me an ASP.NET Core application with razor pages. And now I'll fire up uh, Visual Studio Code. So very shortly, it will ask me if I want to add some uh, assets to the project. There we go. Yes. Now I could just come over here and run F5 to bring up the 
application in a web browser, but we've all seen that. We know what that looks like. It's not very exciting. So let's dive right in and start adding project references. So I go to my csproj file and I add reference to the Electron Net API package, which is on nougat.org. This is the latest stable version. Then I'll go to my program file add using statement for the package I just added. Come down here to create host builder. And here's the call that I need to make to actually use uh, the Electron configuration. And I like to make sure that I'm in development mode just in case an exception gets raised, I have uh, access to the full uh, stack trace to my application. Now I go to startup. Again, I'll add using statement. And I'll go to the bottom of the existing configuration method. And I'm going to add this little test. Uh, if I'm running as Electron and not in a standard web page, then I'm going to call the create window method, which I will insert right here. So I use the Electron API to asynchronously create a standard application window. And since it's the only window in my application, uh, as soon as it closes, I'm going to quit everything. Now I need to add a terminal window for myself because this is the way that which we're going to uh, launch applications. So if you're a first time Electron.net user, the first thing you would do is .NET tool install electronnet.cli and make that global. Now I've already um, installed this, so I'll just do a, do a list of my global tools so that you can see that it's there and it exposes a command called electronize. And I may be running through things kind of quickly, but don't worry, all the source code is on uh, GitHub so you could catch up later. Now, the first time I get my application started, it's just a one-time command to init, creates a manifest file. Now I can use Electronize to start the application. Now, the first time I run it, it may be a little slow, but subsequent runs will be much faster. So now when this actually launches, I will see a application window that looks like a, a regular Mac window and it'll have the uh, custom or not the custom, but the standard boilerplate uh, welcome page for ASP.NET Core. And very shortly that will appear. And one of the things you need to do is make sure you save your files before you start it. So that's, yeah, let's just do that. Okay, now I've saved everything. Let's try that again. Normally when you F5, it'll do that for you, but because we're not using F5, you have to be extra vigilant about uh, saving your work. Okay, here we are. So there's our standard uh, ASP.NET boilerplate. And if we go to the top of the screen, you see that we have a standard Electron menu for our application. So we have an about box, you know, standard file edit view window commands. So that's the same default menu that Electron itself would give you. Uh, later on, we'll see how to, how to customize that. So let's get started by adding some uh, content, replacing our uh, default page. So let's maximize again. So first thing I'll do 
So I had a, a using statement and I'm going to use system diagnostics because uh, the purpose of the demo app is to show a list of system processes. And then we'll drill down to look at details and uh, sh uh, show other uh, features that you can do with electron.net. So after the using statement, I need to add a uh, property to my page model. So this is just a list of system processes. And in my on get handler, I'm going to call the get processes method. I'll filter out things that don't have a name. Let me uh, make this more visible. Yeah, like on uh, Linux, some processes may be nameless. So I don't want to show those and filter out some other things that are uh, too long and just return uh, those items in a list. So the next thing I want to do is add some markup. So I'll replace the standard boilerplate div. with a uh, bootstrap table with three columns. And for each process, I show uh, item ID, amount of memory it uses, and also process name. And I have a try catch block there just in case. I prefer the module name because uh, some operating systems truncate the process name. So I try to get the module name. And if that doesn't work, I just fall back on the process name. So that's the explanation for the try catch block there. So now we remember to save our work this time. And now when the application window starts, it will show a, a table with all of the uh, system processes running. So there we go. I'm going to keep this open so we could see how debugging works. So because we're not using uh, F5 to launch, get an automatic debugger attachment, what we need to do is use the .NET Core attach command. And when I've run that, it'll ask me the name of the process to attach to. So I'll give it the name of my project here, which is processes running on electron port 8001. And let's set a breakpoint on line 25. So in order to trigger that breakpoint, I'm going to go to the view menu of my electron app and reload. And now I have my breakpoint is hit. So I can go to the watch window, figure out how many processes there are. So now I'll uh, close this application. Okay. Now, typically when you have a uh, list of things like that in an ASP.NET Core application, you expect to be able to click on an item and go to its detail view. So let's create a new page for that purpose. The output in the existing pages folder, give it a name of view, and I'll make the namespace consistent with what my other pages already have. Okay. Now I go to the code behind for my new file. So I add some using statements, one for the diagnostics and another for uh, Electron uh, API and the entities, which gives me uh, some constants that I'll need for doing a message box. So let's replace the whole view model. So this will give me, well, first off in the constructor, I define a list of properties that I'm interested in. So then my on get handler will take an integer ID. So I'll look up the process by the ID. If not found, I go to the not found page. I'm gonna add one more item here. And this will be a post handler. 
So before I kill a process, I want to ask the user if they really want to do that. So I define some message box options like the buttons, which one's default, which one's cancel. Then I call the show message box async method. And if that response is the default one, I kill the process, go to the home page. Otherwise, I uh, just stay where I am. So now let's add some markup to the view. So here's, we have a description table. I take the a list of property names, uh, turn them into uh, property infos. So I use reflection to get the property name and the value for the current item. And here's my uh, submit button uh, to kill the process, plus another button to just go back to the home page. Now to tie this all together, I'm going to make one change to my home page, go where I have the item, static item ID, and I'm going to make that uh, an anchor that goes to my view page and passes the correct ID number. So now remembering to save my work. Now I'll start. And let's, let's do something else. Let's get a calculator going. Reload. All right, so there's my calculator. So now when I click the ID, I go to the detail. If I say no to the kill, it stays there. And if I say yes, poof, the calculator's gone. So now we've seen how to add a message box. Let's take it a step further and have a file save dialog. So there's be two UI components involved here. First, uh, the, the file save dialog and also a menu item to make it work. The, before we do that, let's add another page to actually handle the, re, uh, the request to do the save as. Add another new page and I'll call this one save as. My standard using statement. And I'm going to replace the on get handler with async on get handler, which is going to be passed full path name that's selected by the end user. And to that path name, I'm going to write out my process data in the CSV file format. So now the real work begins with the, uh, the menu customization. So let's go back to the startup module and add appropriate using statements. I do interrupt services because I need to know if I'm running on a Mac or not. And we'll see why shortly. So let's create menu. We'll add a routine to create a menu and we'll add one line to call it. And let's briefly take a look at uh, what we have here. So I've determined if I'm on a Mac or not. If I am on a Mac, I'm gonna need to add a system menu. So uh, you notice that some of these menu roles that are provided are only work on Mac OS. So the file menu is shared by all the platforms. The only difference being the whether it's called close on the Mac or quit on Windows and Linux. Uh, here, the interesting work is done by the this new menu item that creates a save as command. So whenever that's clicked, I create some uh, dialogue options to filter on CSV files called the show save dialogue async API. So if that returns a non-empty string. That is in fact the path name where I want to save my results. So I pass the result to the save as page and I don't know a priori what the port number is going to be. So I use the expression bridge settings.webport to make sure I get the correct port. Uh, the view menu is the same for all platforms. And uh, if I'm on a Mac, 
Then I create a menu structure uh, with the main menu. And otherwise, it's just file and view. And you have to create uh, custom menus in this way. You can't just like append items to an empty array. You have because of the way items are serialized. You have to create your menu structure in one shot, and then pass it to uh, the electron menu set application menu API. So we will save all. Now this time we'll see that we have a different uh, application menu. Okay. So we only have file and view in addition to our main menu, but now file has a save as item. So when I pick that, it gives me a, a Macintosh file save. So I'll call this snapshot.csv. Close that, go back to Visual Studio Code. So there we see a file snapshot CSV that I just created. And if I right click open preview, there's all my data in the CSV form. And in case you're wondering how I got this snazzy view of a CSV file, uh, there's an extension that I uh, created and published to the uh, Visual Studio Code marketplace called Excel Viewer. So you wanna check that out if you have time. Uh, it also handles Excel spreadsheets as well. Okay, uh, back to the um, item at hand. And the last thing uh, we're gonna to try to do is create uh, a page that has a custom control in it. So we'll create those pages, call it charts. And very, quickly try to get through uh, the remaining steps. So we need another uh, package reference. This is for the uh, component one, uh, which is a Grape City brand C1 ASP.NET Core MVC package. Then we go to view imports where we add our tag helpers for that package. Then go into the layout and we need custom scripts and styles to go with it. While I'm here, I don't really need the privacy link. I'm just gonna rename that to chart. Now I'll go back to startup.cs. And because of the way I created this application, .NET new web app, uh, I don't have all the uh, proper endpoints that I need to use that MVC control. So I'll end those or add those now. So if I had created a canonical MVC app, I would have gotten this, but because I went the razor pages route, I have to add this myself. That's the reason for that. So now we go to the uh, chart code behind. Diagnostics, replace the model. So here I just uh, grab a list of all the available processes, sort them by descending memory usage, take the top 10. Then I'll go to my markup and add some markup for the component one chart. Customize the axes, add series for the physical memory. Now I'll save all these items. And now I'll get uh, in the main menu bar a chart link that will show me uh, process usage. And there we are. Okay, and then there's our chart. Now I don't have time to uh, actually do a build for other platforms, but the way you would do that is electronize, build, pick a target, like let's say Linux, publish, ready to run, false. But this is all, all in the readme. 
do have a little video that shows what that would look like under Linux. So there's a chart with a completely different uh, group of processes. Drill down into detail. The message box is in uh, Linux format. And likewise, file save as uses the native uh, save as dialog under Linux. So I think we got through everything. Uh, if you're curious about the chart control and other components that Grape City offers, uh, you can go to grapecity.com slash component one. Uh, have any kind of control, any kind of control for just about every .NET platform uh, with support for .NET 5. And if you'd like to see the uh, source code for this demo, go to my GitHub page at uh, slash jjubak. So I think, uh, at this point, we're ready to take some questions. Yes, I was just waiting you to finish up. So thank you so much, John, for for presenting. Let me bring up the questions here. We have a we have a couple questions. Um, Coding with David wants to know: Does Electron.net work with Blazor WebAssembly? Yeah, I have not actually experimented with that, but okay. I I know people are using it with Blazor, okay. whether it's server side or client side. Uh, I'd have to do a little more research, but that's one of my next items on my to-do list okay. is to uh, have a Blazor version of the, you know, this particular uh, presentation and, and blog about it. Yeah, I think a lot of, you know, based on the feedback we've gotten from other sessions uh, for an entire conference, people are really looking ways to get into Blazor. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that's great that, you know, that we, that, we, that, that we have flexibility to do something like that. All right, let me look at the other question. The next question is from Admir, wanting to know, uh, can we in Electron app get rid of standard browser hotkeys? For example, F5 backspace right click. Does Electron depend on OS installed browser and its version? Uh, I'm not sure about the, the hotkeys, how you would override okay. those. Not something I've, I've tried to do. Well, 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 so let's look at it this way. It has what is the what is the typical approach for something like that? Would you just you know we just let it uh, let Electron just handle whatever the operating system offers, or something different? Yeah, typically you would just stick with the you know the norms of the operating okay. system. But that's why like the the menus are defined in such a way, mm -hmm. like even the ones I customized. Uh, if you use the menu role item, it'll choose the appropriate hotkey for the appropriate platform. So you don't have to think about well, what's the hotkey on Windows versus gotcha. the hotkey on Linux. Sure, that's great to know. Thank you. All right, Liz, we have two more questions after this one. All right, the next question is uh, from Sridhar. Does the Electron app take care of hosting the web server too? What if I have multiple Electron apps and is there is this and if there's a port co um, conflict? Uh, that's prob not a situation that I've okay. I've encountered, but I, I know it can run on, I think it, by default, it will just pick another port number to use. Mm -hmm. Like if I were to run this demo twice, I don't think I would have collisions. I would have two separate versions, one on 8001, one on 8002. Whether that would, I know that's possible, like whether it require any additional configuration, I'm not certain right now. Gotcha. Yep. And then the last question we have from uh, Andrew Nonsenko, who was actually a speaker in the conference earlier. So it's great that our speakers are actually watching the content as well. He says, great topic and talk. Thanks, um, John Jubeck. A question, did you have a chance to try Chromely yet? Uh, Chromely.org. And if so, would you still prefer Electron.net over Chromely? For a future project, in my have, he says, I, in my in my opinion, we need a pure .NET Electron like shell for Blazor desktop apps. <laughs> yeah, I have not uh, tried Chromely at all, so I have to have to pass on that question. Cool, no, no worries. Uh, I think that's it. We are ready for our next um, guest here. So, John, thank you so much for taking uh, the time to um, share your knowledge and your passion with the community. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you so much.